All right, we're in the summer movie series. I love movies. I love movies. Uh, Norm Townsend's here today. We had a professor all the way back in our undergraduate years, about four or five years ago. We were in our bachelor's degree. And I uh, had a professor that really influenced me because he said, if you want to know the voice of a generation, watch their movies, watch their shows, read their books, listen to their music, because what's in popular culture speaks to what the world is thinking. And that, to me, that creates a bridge of conversation. You're going to see today how we're going to use a movie that has nothing to do with Christianity, it has a bridge into a conversation about spiritual things. And I also love the movies and pop culture because I really believe that God leaves what I call breadcrumbs. They're, they're deep thoughts about spiritual issues that Christians can address that can lead someone to a deeper conversation as they reflect on. I don't know if you've ever had a conversation with someone who sees a popular movie and there's just, you hear them, you're like, they're talking about things that are related to faith. And so we try to use the series to help people learn that skill and maybe even address some for people today. I don't know about you, but we're living in a difficult world, right? So when I turn on, over the course of the last year, whether it's the news I'm listening to, or the stuff that pops up on my feed or whatever, you're seeing these big issues just cascading at us, one right after the other. Whether it's war in the Ukraine or war in the Middle East, there's war in the world, and we see graphic images of war now. The war in the Middle East has come to American shores, creating tremendous unrest whether it's in Congress or on college campuses, our students in the midst of tremendous protests creating moments even of violence at colleges. We're all wondering about the impact of artificial intelligence. Will this lead us to a better future or will it undermine humanity and destroy us? We've had that conversation from brilliant people who can't find an answer to that question. We're wrestling through a uh, heat wave sweep it across the United States, kill some people. Weather has become a dangerous element that has taken human lives, right? We're seeing an assassination attempt of a former president live on TV. We're watching contentious politics that's fomenting a society that's contributing to the violence that we're experiencing in our world around us. And we got a cost of housing in the United States that's making it difficult for people just to find a place to live. For some, it's become so impossible they're living on the street because <clears throat> they can't find a place to live. And these type of situations create turbulent times that produce emotions in us that can feel overwhelming. The turbulence goes from the world to our souls, right? So we feel fear. We get angry. Anxiety seems to take our breath away. Some of us become depressed, <clears throat> or at the very least, sad. We find ourselves struggling with disgust over people and their decisions, or we despair for the life we feel. I know this summer movie series is supposed to be a little light. We know there's kids and the teens in the room, but you know what? The world is as hard for our children and our teenagers as it is for adults. <clears throat> Homelessness attacks our kids and our teens just like it does adults. Kids live in houses that they pick up the emotional temperature of the home of their parents. Right? So they, whatever their parents are feeling, it often washes down into their kids. And life's not easy to be a kid. You get bullied, you're struggling at school, there's conflict at home. Kids bear that pain. Teenagers, now I've often said that the, this generation of teens is, can only be compared to the great generation that went through, two world, went through the two world wars and the Great Depression in terms of the struggles and the life that they're living, right? And, you know, and it could even be everything from, I don't know what I'm going to do for a career. I didn't get into the college I want. My girlfriend, my boyfriend broke up with me. I've been ostracized from my friends, so I'm going home to a family that seems to be falling apart. Whether you're a child, a teen, or an adult, the turbulence of the world around us gets inside of us. And that's what I want to talk about today. How to manage turbulent times. That's the point of today's message. Now, I'm going to say this because I said it at Hopkinton. I actually 
redirected elements of this message midweek, basically because of what happened last weekend. So what's that mean? Is it means I'm a little off base. But like they say in baseball, you don't have to hit a home run every time. You just got to get on base. So today I'm looking to increase my OBP by just getting on the first with a message, okay? Uh, and Hopkinton said, no, no one that I could see left, but it's a dark room, so I don't know, right? I can see all of you, <laughs> right? So bear with me and let's pray. God, thank you for this moment in time. Jesus, I want people to meet you, to know you, and to follow you because peace comes when we follow you. Lord, it's a turbulent world and it gets inside of us. But Lord, in the midst of the turbulence of the world around us, what I'm praying for is the peace that passes understanding that comes only from you to touch the hearts, the mind, and the souls of people. Be present, I pray, in this room in such a way, in such a way that we, we feel the tangible presence of Jesus and the voice of God speaking to us. Use me, I pray. Amen. So we're going to look at two different elements. We're going to look at a movie and a streaming series. First, the movie. The movie is A Haunting in Venice. So a secret little thing about me, I love mysteries. But I like the old Victorian min mysteries. I like the mysteries out of England like that are written uh, about Sherlock Holmes. Huge Sherlock Holmes fan. Uh, you could try to convince me, but Benedict Cumberbatch is still the best Sherlock Holmes ever, in my opinion, right? I also love Agatha Christie novels, specifically Hercule Poirot, right, the great Belgian detective. a matter of fact, I think um, de uh, Murder on the Orient Express may be the best mystery ever written, right? That's how I feel about it. And Kenneth Branagh, he's got the mustache. He's reinvigorated the whole uh, Hercule Poirot in such a marvelous way, adding material that wasn't in her stuff. And that's going to be important for today, that you know that. And in this, A Haunting in Venice is not actually the name of the novel it's based on. The name of the novel is based on is Halloween. But in this story, the great Hercule Poirot gets invited to a haunted house. And the premise is, use your detective skills and your scientific approach to either debunk or prove whether the house is really haunted. Spoiler alert, it's not, right? It's in the medium that they bring in, and she's a fraud, and he proves it. But because it's Agatha Christie, murder is on the agenda, right? I love this show and this movie. So in this movie, <clears throat> he is walking into the haunted house for the first time. And he, ends, he starts a conversation. He's in a conversation with the medium they chose to touch the dead. She can't, right? So don't get your knickers up around that. That's an old expression, isn't it, Christy? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're too young to know that expression. <laughs> so let's watch her, this conversation. This is a, watch this movie, and I was like, I stopped the film, and I was like, this is a conversation that Christians can enter into. You don't believe in the soul's endurance after death. I have lost my faith. How sad for you. Yes, it is most sad. The truth is sad. Please understand, madame, I would welcome with open arms any honest sign of devil or demon or ghost. For if there is a ghost, there is a soul. If there is a soul, there is a God who made it. And if we have God, we have everything, meaning, order, justice. But I have seen too much of the world, countless crimes, two wars, the bitter evil of human indifference. And I conclude, no, no God, no ghosts. With respect, no mediums who can speak to them. You were saying? What a great scene. And what a sad declaration. I have lost my faith. What you see in the other two movies based off of this character is then they develop these little snippets of his past that they insert into his story. He, and they show him in war, in the great First World War, and tremendous suffering all around him. As a matter of fact, he falls in love, and then uh, his love tragically ends because in an explosion, he is horrifically scarred. The reason that the great 
detective has that pronounced mustache is to hide the deformity of his mouth as a result of this battle. And he's, he's a wonderful character who leads an obsessively controlled life. There's a great scene at the end of uh, Death on the Nile where he gets his pastries. He has to have a certain amount of number of pastries. He takes them and he has to order them out in a certain arrangement on the table before he can eat them. When he approaches his meal, everything has to be laid out just perfect. His, even his clothes have to be presented with perfection because he is controlling an uncontrollable world. He's trying to bring order into the chaos he's experienced. It has gotten into his soul and has robbed his faith. He's come to the conclusion, because life is so turbulent, there can be no God. He sounds like, so we have these, uh, these poems, these prayers that are preserved in our Bible. It's in a section called Psalms. There's 150 of these wonderful prayers. But he sound, sounds like this uh, cry of the psalmist from Psalm 22. My God, I cry out by day, but you don't answer by night, and I find no answer. I don't know if you've ever been in, through a season of life that was so confusing, so turbulent, so destructive, so painful, whatever adjective you want to use, that it caused you to doubt whether God even existed. And you couldn't find your faith. That's the journey of our detective. And it's the sad journey of many people. It leaves us Christians who have followed God with these emotions, and we start to drown in these emotions, wondering, God, where can I find the stability of faith? How can I find it in such a terrible world or season of my life? Now we're going to go actually 180 degrees in a completely different uh, direction. We're leaving our great Belgian detective, and we're going to follow Jesus. Okay, there's a streaming series that has been released. It's called The Chosen. Its creator is Dallas Jenkins. Love this. This is probably my favorite cinematic presentation of Jesus, period. There will be a total of seven seasons, and the fourth season was just released. Absolutely love this, right? Now, one of the things that Dallas Jenkins does, and if you really miss it, if you download the app, right, um, in addition to all the episodes, there's these roundtables, with people who are a part of the, um, the, the crew and the actors. And they talk about things. And Dallas Jenkins freely admits, he says, I've included what is called extra biblical material. That's a scholarly word for saying stuff that isn't in the Bible. Right? He says, I'm providing background to some of the characters that are important that we don't know much about. So some of it, he goes, purely conjecture. And one of them is this... Uh, is a character that's going to be called Eden. We'll talk about her in a second. But it's just a fabulous presentation. Really love it. Really love it. And I'm okay with the extra biblical stuff because he freely admits, I'm putting this in there, to help the, the viewer find a bridge to connect to Jesus. Because he's not just telling the story of Jesus. He wants you to experience Christ and to imagine what it was like to be in the world of that day. And so these two characters are here. This is Peter. You might know Peter, like St. Peter, like Peter's Basilica, like Petersburg. He's like one of the big, he's the, one of the big dogs in the game of uh, the disciples, the followers of Jesus. He becomes a significant leader in the life of the church. And they present Jesus, uh, Peter as an impetuous, outspoken, sort of tumultuous man, which he probably was. We know from reading our Bible that he was married because he has a mother-in-law. And there's only one way to get a mother-in-law, and that's to get to marry someone who has a mom, right? And so there's a scene where Jesus is involved in, a mother, in the mother-in-law. And Dallas Jenkins decides, let's flesh out Eden. How can we not? If we're going to tell the story of Jesus uh, training the disciples, there'll be times when Peter goes home and he's got a, a wife. Why not develop a backstory for her? And maybe we can develop something that people can connect to. And so what they show in season four is um, there's a scene that comes right out of the Gospels where Jesus takes his followers, the top 12, he breaks them up into two by two, and he sends them off. He goes, I want you to get some ministry experience. So just teach people what I'm teaching you. Right? And believe it or not, you can be able to do some of the things that I'm doing. 
right? Some of the miracles, you're actually going to be able to do that. I want you to experience ministry in advance so that we can process it and I can prepare you for ministry in the future. So Peter takes off and goes, does this. While this is happening, we discover that his wife Eden is pregnant, which is a big deal, right? It's a big deal today, and it's kind of was like, there was like a different depth to it, even biblical times, because children were your future, right? And you wanted to pass on the family name in line. So big deal. While Peter is away doing ministry for Jesus, she has a miscarriage. And the prognosis is that she may never be able to have kids again. This is horrific. If you've ever been in that scenario, you understand the depth of emotional distress you feel from a miscarriage. Eden has a crisis of faith. Her husband is serving Jesus. Her husband is out doing ministry. She is holding down the fort at home. Peter is out there representing Jesus. In the midst of all that, she loses her child. You've got to be kidding me. Peter comes back, and the wife that he experiences isn't the wife that he left. She doesn't tell him right away. And so tension builds up in their marriage, and Peter is confused until finally they sit down, they have this intimate conversation, and she reveals to Peter what happened to her. And the fury of this hits Peter, because Peter is a kind, of a, he's kind of that type of guy. And there's a scene where he goes, he's, he gets away, he's on the top of the roof of his home, and he's, all of a sudden he sees this clay jar, and he picks it up. And, and Dallas Jenkins puts this in there to help you understand the turmoil of his soul. He picks it up, the vase, and he throws it to the ground, and it shatters. And it's meant to represent Peter's heart and the turmoil in his soul. We're going to go into Season 3, Episode 8. Season 3, Episode 8 is a great. Let me see what we got next. Oh, I told you. I'm trying to get on base this morning. So maybe you feel turmoil like that. Because maybe you've got conflict in your life. A relationship that's gone south that you don't understand or one that's always had conflict in it and it, it just like Jesus will keep praying and it doesn't get better. Maybe the war that's gone on in the world around you is affecting you. You see it, it makes you afraid, it gets you upset, it gets you distressed, right? You're worried about the way that it's impacting American politics and even into uh, your kids going to college and you don't know what it's going to be like for them. I had a friend who sent me a video of his son on USC campus. They're getting ready for graduation. There are helicopters in the air and there's protesters. And he just said, it's like the 1960s all over again on our college campus. Maybe you're just going through a season. Something has happened to you where you feel so distressed inside your heart you can barely get out of bed in the morning. Maybe it's the politics of the world around you. It's a turbulent political season, one of the most turbulent political seasons probably in American history, right? <clears throat> and you see it touching the lives of people around you. You're losing friends. You don't know how to have conversation, and it's all coming home, and you don't know how to find peace anymore, and you feel like Peter. Now, <clears throat> Dallas Jenkins did something really interesting with this episode. So what I love about the, the app is not only can you see the, the round table, but they take you to a place where he sits down with a Catholic priest, um, a Protestant minister, and I think he's a um, Messianic Jewish rabbi. He's a rabbi. And they talk about the theology and spirituality of what's going on in these episodes. And the round table for this episode is profound. It's so good. Dallas Jenkins says, I started this episode with Psalm 77. I took us back in time. It's a little confusing when it first starts, and slowly you realize, wait a minute, this is Asaph. He's the guy who wrote a bunch of Psalms, and he's taking a Psalm, and he's reading it for the first time to King David. And Giles Jenkins says, it is a foreshadow of the, of the rest of the episode, and I want you to understand what Peter is going through through the words of a psalmist. And this is a beautiful Psalm, Psalm 77. I cried out to God, Yes, they shout, oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for God. All night long I prayed with hands lifted towards heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. 
You don't let me sleep. I'm too distressed even to pray. I think of the good old days, long since ended, when my nights were filled with joyful songs. Now, I search my soul and ponder the difference. Has the Lord rejected me forever? Will he never again be kind to me? Is his unfailing love gone forever? Have his promises permanently failed? Has God forgotten to be gracious as he slammed the door in his compassion? I don't know if you've ever felt like that. What I love about these prayers that are in the center of our Bible is they're so honest. And they give us permission to pray like this. They give us permission to feel all those emotions. It's okay. Dallas Jenkins started the episode with this psalm. It's not the whole psalm, but this portion of the psalm because he wanted you to understand this is Peter's personal condition. And through this episode, right, He's on a walk with John, who's another apostle, and John confronts him, and he's like, hey, dude, what's going on, man? You're just like, you kind of being a jerk. And Peter tells him what happens, and John just breaks down. He's like, oh, I'm so sorry. And Peter is angry. He's been avoiding Jesus, not showing up when he's supposed to show up. He's late to this meeting. Jesus is in a section of the world that isn't totally Jewish. There's a bunch of Gentiles there, so it's a multiracial moment. And uh, Peter's walking in. It's kind of a fomented moment. And Jesus talks to Peter, and Peter doesn't respond. Matter of fact, as the, as the show kind of continues, Peter is angry at Jesus, doesn't want to be near Jesus. Uh, Jesus says, hey, organize yourselves to help with the 5,000. Peter goes far away from Jesus. He's just so mad at Jesus for everything that Eden was mad for. I was serving you when this happened. Then, miraculously, and this is in our Bible, all these, this is 500 men plus their families. So there's thousands upon thousands of people, and they're hungry, and Jesus prays over five loaves of bread and two fishes, and it miraculously feeds all these thousands of people. And Peter is, you got to be kidding me. Where everyone else is rejoicing over this experience, Peter is, you got to be kidding me. You will do this for all these people who hardly know you. And when I went through a trial, you didn't show up. So the day the experience ends and Jesus says to his followers, he's 12 people, like, hey guys, get in a boat, go to the other side of the lake, and I'm going to catch up to you. And a storm happens on the waters. Now, what I love that Dallas Jenkins did and the way he has set this, the whole character up in the whole scene, the storm, it's a real storm, is also a metaphor for Peter's soul. You're going to see Eden going into what's called the mikvah. <clears throat> it's a Jewish uh, tradition that helps women who have experienced something like this find healing in their faith. And they're going to intersperse Peter's journey of, with Christ with Eden's mikvah. And keep in mind that the environment reflects his heart. And listen carefully. You can, we put the subtitles on to what Peter says. I said everybody stop! Stop, stop, stop! Okay, stop. Let me move! That's not a ghost! Are you crazy? Chasing after Gentiles when your own people have problems right here. 
when your own person has problems. I've been right here in front of you, believing in you, but you're breaking up by sending the Decapolis? Then come to me. You, weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. on me. I'm here. I'm always here.
What a beautiful presentation of what Christians call a crisis of faith, a season of life or an event that so strikes us that it causes us to doubt God, his existence, and his love for us. And I love the journey of the whole thing. I love the journey of, I like, I love, they said that they, they wanted to affirm something. Of course Peter has faith. Right? He stepped out of the boat. But before that, Peter's proclamation, like, I've always had faith. I've given up everything to follow you. I've always had faith. Then why weren't you there when I needed you? And Jesus calls out to him and into the storm. Jesus doesn't still the storm until afterwards, right? He draws Peter to him. And then what Dallas Jenkins says, he wanted to show both um, Peter, he wanted to show, how, show both Peter and Eden having a baptism experience in the midst of suffering, going down and coming up differently in the midst of this whole journey. And so Peter reminds us, in this, Dallas Jenkins does a couple of things in the middle of this to help us, because he's drawn us into this, but he wants to help us. Maybe you feel what Peter felt at some point. Because Peter's deal, dealing with this question. How can life be so turbulent if I follow you? Maybe some of you have felt that. And I love, so this is an Easter egg. Dallas Jenkins takes these words. Twice, he puts into the mouth of Jesus in the scene verses from different sections of the Bible. Once when he says, come to me, you who are weary and laden points to Peter to remind us, I'm talking to you. Not to the royal you, or to the everyone you, but I'm talking to you. And then he says to Peter, <clears throat> they prove the genuineness of your faith. Because Peter's wrestling, why am I experiencing this turbulence in my life if I've chosen to give up everything to follow you? And Jesus says, they prove the genuineness of your faith. And Dallas Jenkins says, it's a subtle reference to a letter that Peter wrote in our Bible called 1 Peter, in which Peter writes, pure gold put to the fire comes out of it, proved pure. And genuine faith put through this suffering is proved genuine. He said, I wanted people to see that Peter learned lessons following Jesus that he would share later in his life to those who are also following Jesus. And so this letter of Peter is written to a church that's being violently persecuted for their faith. It would have been people who said, we're following Jesus and people are trying to kill us. We're following Jesus and we have to leave our homes. How can this happen? <clears throat> and Peter, going back to this moment of his own journey with Jesus, would cry out, because genuine faith is proved through suffering to be genuine. Part of of the reason that God allows turbulent times into our lives, and no generation has escaped turbulence. It's for this reason. You know what happens when you go through? Isn't it? It's easy to put our faith in Jesus in this room. It's climate controlled, right? We're all friendly. We're singing great music. You're hearing a stirring message from a brilliant preacher, right? <clears throat> you miss this. It's easy to have faith. And they were talking about what we wanted to show the difference between faith and trust. Trust is what you do during turbulent times. And I would say, I follow this theory, that your commitments have to be tested to be proved genuine. And during these turbulent times, you get caught with questions like these. Do I really trust God? Or we get, we, we're forced to examine, where does my peace come from? Why does the news take away my peace? Where does my peace come from? What are my priorities? So that, why am I so disappointed when I don't achieve my priorities, my ambitions, my goals? Who sets those? Or in times of turbulence, we're faced with this question, how strong is my commitment? Because we, we have to be tested for ourselves. Not that God's trying to, God knows your faith. God is revealing to you your faith so that you can grow. And then there's another statement from Jesus in the midst of this. They strengthen you these times. That comes out of the letter written by Jesus' brother James, 
where James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Athletes understand this. Athletes understand that performance on the field and performance on the court is directly related to physical training. And so in a sense, they punish their bodies. They put their bodies through trial and through suffering in order to make it strong so that when the game time hits and they're on the court and they're on the field, they can rise to the occasion and succeed. Without testing their bodies in order to strengthen their bodies, they'll never be a good athlete on the field. And for us as Christians, we have to go through, we go through times of suffering and it strengthens us if we choose to continue to follow Christ. And this is, the, this is the struggle. So this, this whole scene from the Bible, it's out of Matthew's gospel, is a hyperlink. Last week, Nate talked about hyperlinks, sections of the Bible that relate to different sections. This, this whole scene is Jesus playing out a psalm, a song, literally. Because let me read to you this psalm. Some went off in ships and seas, plying the trade routes of the world. They, too, observed God's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke, winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens, plunged again to the depths. Their sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wits' end. Lord, help, they cried out in their trouble. And he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. Sound familiar? What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. When you've suffered, you understand the beauty of peace in a still moment, right? Let them praise the Lord for his great love and the wondrous things he's done for them. Let them exalt publicly before the congregation, before the leaders of the nation. In my life, and I've had this conversation plenty with other people, and they would affirm it, <clears throat> some of my greatest demonstrations of the power and love of God came through the most turbulent seasons of my life. It was in the storm that I experienced his power and his love for me. And if I had avoided the storm, <clears throat> if I had tried to remove myself from the turbulence, I never would have learned those lessons. But Christ met me in the turbulence. He came to me when I was at my worst and touched me and saved me. <clears throat> turbulent times reveal the genuineness of your faith, and turbulent times can strengthen us. But how? The big question comes out. So I told you that this episode started in the reading of Psalm 77. Psalm 77 starts with incredible distress. It's a permission to us to cry out in anger, confusion, pain, depression, grief. It ends differently. The psalmist takes us on a journey, and at the end of the psalm, he gives us some clues on how we can get through the storm to get to a solid time. Do you want to know what he says? Then read the Bible. I just gave you the psalm. I mean, come on, folks. I can't hold your hand through life, right? Take responsibility for your own walk with Jesus. Open up the Bible this week and read Psalm 77, and you'll discover some help from someone who went through a turbulent season but found a stronger faith because of it. Now, here's a little, um, I'm going to wind down in a minute. Here's a little side note for me. This is a particularly precious scene from the life of Jesus to me because when I went through a journey where I didn't know where I was going to end up, I was wondering if I was going to die even, I spent a lot of time in this passage. So when this clip, when I was watching the season and this clip came up, poor Sheila, she wasn't in the room. She walked in. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, like gross, you know, gross crying versus just simple crying. I was like, Aah! she's like, what's, what's going on? Everything was like, like oh, he saved Jesus, he saved Peter. Because <clears throat> I love this scene. Peter comes up and because he's been in the storm, what does he do? Collapses into the arms of Jesus. And what does he say? Please don't let me go. When I'm angry at you, when I'm rejecting you, when I'm fighting against you, when I'm avoiding you, Please don't let me go. And what does Jesus say? I'm always here. And so I developed this. So you could call it a mantra. 
It's not in a religious way. So it's a mantra is a personal statement or saying you'd repeat to yourself. And during that season, I kept saying to myself this, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Because when he took his eyes off Christ and looked at the storm that he started to sink. And so through this season of my life, it was just like, keep your focus fixed on Jesus. Keep moving forward one step at a time. Because what happens? We stop moving with Jesus. We stop growing. And so we sink. Because we're giving up on that journey. And Jesus is saying, just take one more step. Come on, you can do it. See that whole scene where he's saying to Peter, just look at me. Keep coming to me. And when you start to sink, cry out for help. Because here's the secret. You will start to sink at some point. And that's okay. But cry out to Jesus. It's when Peter starts to sink. It's when he says, help me, Lord, I'm sinking. That's when Jesus reaches below the waves and pulls him up and holds tight to him. How to manage turbulent times.